Volkar and a postdoc of his whom I know, and we were discussing a problem which is also in the sense of extrapolation and asymptotics. One other that came from that I mentioned briefly a couple of days ago. So every couple of days, somebody comes to me with some nice numbers and say, do these work? And sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. So if anybody has a nice sequence that they want to offer or, or any other kind of problem that they want to mention, uh, now's a possible time. So today, first of all, let me remind you, also people who aren't here physically, the format of the course. This is lecture number seven out of 12, which means exactly half of the course is over. And the first three weeks and the fourth week, which is this week, today and Thursday, were always Tuesday and Thursday from 4 till 5.30. But I'm just reminding you now, and I'll say it again on Thursday, the last two weeks, so that's next week and the week after, the course shifts because the room wasn't available to Monday and Wednesday. And I think from 3 to 4.30, but I've forgotten. Maybe it's 3.30. I don't remember. But I'll, I'll announce it again. And it's, of course, on every announcement. Simply don't show up at 4 if you don't want to miss one hour. OK, so is that Atish by any chance? I'm so near sighted I can't tell. He said he might come. So I just mentioned you. I said that the question to do with asymptotics came up actually in conversation with you today. And I actually wrote a little program. And it kind of works and kind of doesn't. I might even mention it briefly just to emphasize the point that this kind of question, asymptotics, interpolation, extrapolation, uh, evaluation of divergent series come up all the time in physics and mathematics, and they're a lot of fun. So I will start by the last two lectures were mostly on these uh, various versions of how to extrapolate, now how to guess the asymptotics of a sequence. And I did that two times ago. I reviewed it last time. But let me review it very briefly again, because there were, last time I talked about variance. And one of the variants I said I didn't know how to solve. And then a voice came out of the heavens, but it was Campbell Wheeler, uh, saying that he had worked out a way of doing it. And I was very impressed he'd done it in 20 minutes, because it was only a few minutes after I'd mentioned the problem. And I've thought about it off and on for a couple of years, not very much. But then he sent me an email afterwards saying, actually, I sent it to you in May of last year. But of course, I'd forgot. I never read it. So I looked at his method. And it's kind of cute. And it kind of works. But as he himself said, it kind of doesn't work. It doesn't work as well as the method I explained. The method I explained gives you the coefficients. It zeroes in on them and gives you, for instance, 50 digits, 100 digits, if you have enough numbers. His doesn't quite. But it zeroes in, you can get quite a few digits. And then, if you're lucky, uh, you can, well, first of all, you can improve the method. I didn't think about it that much. But I, he sent me an example. And, and I worked it out for myself. Well, I sent him a test example. I said, OK, here's the sequence. Can you find the exponents? And he did. And then I tried. And it, it does work. And it's fun. So I'll tell that to start today's course. It wasn't per se planned, because I didn't know about it. But it's planned now. So first, let, since you, know, you probably didn't catch his name, and very few of you probably know him personally, Campbell Wheeler. He's an Australian, but one can still usually understand his English, although sometimes less. So, and his mathematics is, is very good. I mean, his English is good, too. It's just it sounds a bit different from uh, America that I'm used to, or British that I'm also kind of used to. OK, so first let me remind you the basic method. And we'll come back to that for several things. So the situation that comes up many times, and I'm going to repeat it, although it's now the third time, but I'll do it very briefly. Let's say you have a sequence of numbers, and you know, say, in a typical case, you can compute each one, but it costs money and time. So let's say you know 500 values to 200 digits. I mean, obviously, these numbers can change. But you don't know 10 million values. You have some relative restricted numbers. Sometimes it's a few thousand. Sometimes it's only 50. But you should know them to high precision. Sometimes they're integers. Then you just know them exactly. But sometimes they're real or complex numbers. And then we can make an ansatz. There may be a power of n factorial. If there is, it's called Givray type alpha. I'll come back to that today if I get around to it. There may then be a smaller term, which is a pure exponential. There may be a yet smaller term, which is the power of n. And then there may be a power series. Uh, and in last time, I discussed that there are many variants of this. 
So EG variance, uh, so EG uh, AN, well, I explained the, other, the first time that all of this is kind of window dressing because if you have this, then if you just look at AN over AN minus one, it starts with N to the alpha times the similar. So if you reduce to this case, if you have this case, you take AN over AN minus one and it starts one and the next term is gamma over N. So basically, if you know how to do just the power series part, you can get gamma, uh, alpha and then beta and then gamma very easily. So although that often happens, we can ignore it. And so uh, variance, well, the, the easiest, and this is the one that came up in the problem I just mentioned of, of Atish Dabulkar, uh, specifically, I mean, he knew that there was such a, uh, an expansion. But this time, there's a log n term as well. And then a very tiny variation of the method gives you c. And I computed it this morning to 100 digits. In principle, in his case, we know how to compute c in closed form with theta series. But it would actually be more work to compute it, work out the, all the theta series, and not make a mistake. But here, I had exactly this situation. I had 500 numbers to 200 decimals. And I got c easily to 100, 110 digits from that information. So then another, uh, or another one ignoring these preterms would be C0 plus C1 over n to the 1 half plus C2 over n. And that one, as I explained last time, is quite a bit harder. Of course, one can do the following, and that's what uh, Emmanuel Carnero asked. Can't you just restrict this sequence to squares, and then you're back in the previous case? And you can. And in fact, I even told an example from work of Andrews where uh, I had guessed from the vague numerics that it did a power series in n to the one third. But I didn't know the right way, and so I just took the cubes. But then I had to go up, I took the first 50 cubes. That meant n was going up to you know, 30,000 or some, whatever 50 cubed is. And in order to interpolate well with so little data, I needed to compute them to 20,000 digits. It took four hours on a computer. Whereas last time I explained a method that works in these variant situations with square roots and cube roots, and then the same calculation took three seconds instead of four hours, and also gave 50 digits of, of the leading terms. So last time I talked about such uh, various variants of the basic method, but there was one variant that I said I actually didn't know how to do, and that's the one where Campbell immediately said he did. So let's assume that we have a uh, a sum of two such terms. So let's say beta to the n sum ck over, say, beta 1 to the n over n to the k. So this, of course, all, everything is asymptotic. And there's a beta 2 to the n and maybe a beta 3 to the n times the third one. But, but I'm only finally meant in the case I had, there were uh, one of the cases I showed last time, there were two. Uh, uh, well, I, I don't like to put prime double rhyme at the n, so you can, um, it's somewhat mixed notation. So let's say that your ansatz, that you expect that there are three exponential terms. So you see, if there are three power series and you add them, the sum of power series is a power series. But the sum of power series, uh, even power series multiplied by n to the one third, is still a power series in n to the one third. With different exponentials, it isn't. So the trick that we used here, if I didn't have the factorial to immediately get beta, is just take a n over a n minus 1. Then if n is large, that's almost exactly beta. You apply the extrapolation method to the quotient, a n over a n minus 1. But here, here of course, if beta 1 in absolute value were to be bigger than beta 2 and beta 3, then there'd be no problem. Because if n is 500, and this is exponentially much bigger, you can just ignore those two terms. You apply the method. You'd get this series. And if you're really lucky, you can subtract it off and get that. But the problem is that these might be complex numbers with the same absolute value. So if there are three of them, one could be, for instance, real and two complex conjugate, or they could be completely you know, unknown numbers. And so last time, I explained that there is a nice way if you know what these exponents are. And I gave a very complicated example from quantum spin networks, paper of Garofalidis and van der Ven, where there were many terms. But there was a complicated recursion. And from the recursion, from the leading term, you knew that beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3 were specific numbers, which did indeed all of the same absolute value. And then you can use a method to eliminate one, one part of the series at a time. But what I said is if we suspect that it's like this, but we don't know what the betas are, I didn't know 
the good way. I mean, very roughly, you might do it by plotting and seeing the oscillation and doing kind of harmonic analysis, but that would be extremely inefficient. And so Campbell's method does work. So let me first, before I tell the method, tell this test case that I actually took. So the test, which I sent him, just as, you know, I said, here are some numbers, which I constructed for the purpose, and see if you can do it. So I took three betas. Uh, originally, they were the square root of 19, 3 plus the square root of minus 10, so i squared of 10, and 3 minus the square root of minus 10. But for two reasons, I rescaled all three of them by 3 over 13. One was, of course, to make it hard. At, you, know, you can't just guess by looking. You say, aha, that's this, you know, I have that number to two decimals, and then you try squaring, and then you see 19.000. I try to make it not quite easy to, to guess. You have to get a certain amount of precision. But also, these numbers are quite close to 1. So the numbers were, uh, didn't blow up very much. And then I just chose. Uh, so, so this was beta 3. And then I just chose the k and ck, and ck prime and ck double prime. I just asked Pari to, I went from 0 to 11, and just asked for random one-digit numbers. And it doesn't matter at all what they were, but it's uh, one sequence started 7, 1, uh, 7, 1, minus 10, and the last one was minus 2, and one started, this happened also 7, 0, and again minus 10, and 1, and the third one started 4, minus 2. Actually, these weren't the CKs. If I called the CK, it was actually, uh, I'll say exactly what I took, I beta 1 to the n times the sum CK over n to the k, but I multiplied it, you know, again, that you can't just guess by pi. And then the second term I multiplied by the cube root of pi again to make it a little harder to guess. And then you take beta 2 to the n and the sum ck prime plus ck double prime squared of minus 10 over n to the k. So this is a real number with these values. So this was meant to be essentially random. Uh, and then he, he wrote back, uh, you know, very quickly, and he said the computer took 12 seconds. And I think beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3, and he gave them eight digits, and they were indeed correct. So then you know, I, I looked at what he'd done. At first, it seemed to give very few digits. Now, so it gives a bit more. So just for fun, well, it's, it's a fun method anyway. It's one more variant. So you remember how we did with a n, with the original one. The trick, remember, was you pick the number h, which to re, as a mnemonic, I said, think of h, but it could be 20. It's some not too big and not too small number which you have to choose, you try several, depending on the situation. You multiply your given sequence by a to the n, and then you take the h -th difference and divide by h factorial. So then this one, by simple computation, I'm assuming now that a n has, does not have the exponential and the factorial and the um, power of terms, so it's just c0 plus c1 over n and so on. Then you find out very easily that this starts a bunch of zeros, and the next term is ch plus 1 over n to the h plus 1. And therefore, if you just stop, you take a large n, like 500, then here you're off by 1 over 500, but here you're off by 1 over 500 to the ninth, which is already very accurate. So that was the very simple method. So remember that this delta n, delta h of, of any sequence, a n, would be the sum uh, m from 0 to h, or let's call it r, it's easier to read, uh, minus 1 to the r, uh, binomial coefficient h over r, a, and then you shift up by r, retain the forward difference, uh, and then, well, that's it. OK? So that's what, what I had done. But of course, you, this is the delta with minus 1. So Campbell's idea was this. You do the same. But here, h, remember, was small. So here, n was our number that's very big. It's the number of terms you have. And h is maybe 8. If you try to take the 500 difference right away, you'll get complete nonsense. But he said, let's do it differently. Not, See, the reason you get nonsense is you're taking the difference and the difference of the difference. And so you're magnifying any fluctuation immensely. But he said, well, what if we do the same? But we take not the difference, but again, h over r. Uh, a n plus r, but I multiply by some other number, x to the h minus r. Maybe this was also h minus r. It doesn't, doesn't matter. There's a sign. So he said, let's take this. And now we can take h much bigger and to fix ideas. But of course, one could vary this. You could h, h to be 2n or half n or 0.75 times n rounded off. He just took uh, 
n terms. So in other words, you're going, you're using the values, so let's call this one now a n tilde. So we make out of our sequence a new sequence, which is this kind of x deformation. That was his idea. But you notice, since I took n terms, I could, as I say, take two n terms, then this would go up to three n. That means if I only have five n terms, my n would have to stop at 170. Or I could take this h to be only a fifth of n, and I could go up you know, much further. But he took n. As I said, that's a parameter you could vary. So here, n goes up to uh, you know, 1 up to n over 2, if you know n values. So if you know n values, which might be 500, you have to stop here at n over 2, because you're adding to the original index this. Now let's look what this is. So remember, my ansatz now is that a n is supposed to be the sum of a small number, maybe three pure exponentials, presumably of the same sort, or you could easily tell them apart. We won't actually use that directly, but you should think of the three betas as being all on the same absolute value. And in the case I had there, one was real and two were complex conjugate, but they could be anything. And then here we'll have a C, we'll have the sum k from zero to infinity. I mean, of course, it's only asymptotic. And then just as before, there's a power series, CK, but there's one power series for each of the three numbers. So the problem is find beta 1 up to beta uh, j numerically to high, reasonably high precision, hopefully enough that you can either do very high precision, so you know them as real numbers, or if you're lucky, you find them to reasonable precision, but if they're simple, for instance, algebraic numbers, you might be able to recognize them. And then, and also, then uh, C0j, C1j, and so on, which are less important. But actually, you don't have to do that, because once you have the betas, if you have them exactly, then I explained a method last time to reduce this problem to the old one. So the real question is, can we find these exponents when we don't know what they are? Because if we do know what they are, we know what to do. So let's look at this. Well, first, let's assume that I just had one term, beta to the n, so just one and no c's. Well, then beta to the n here, would give me beta to the n plus r. So beta to the n plus r is beta to the n times beta to the r. But then beta to the r x to the n, sorry, this is now this h is now n. Uh, h to the r times x to the n minus r with binomial coefficients. That's just the binomial expansion of beta plus x to the n. And so we find that this thing will look like the sum j from 1 to capital J. And then it will be the uh, this beta j to the n times beta j plus x to the n. And then times uh, the cj0 plus lower terms that don't quite work out, but they still, the next one is of the order of 1 over n, 1 over n squared. So let's pretend that that's not going to bother us. And in practice, it won't really bother us. So now what we've done is we have new uh, betas, the new beta is, you know, so we've, we've replaced by beta j times beta j plus x. We can call this number, I don't know, so new number, yj. But all of the betas have the same absolute value, so therefore they're still competing with each other. But the beta j plus x don't have the same absolute value. You know the approximate size of beta j, because if you have 500 terms, you see it grows like 1 to the n, or 2 to the n, or 2 to the minus n. So you know roughly the size of beta j. You can divide by that. And so you can take x of the same sort. So in my example, as I said, I put in the 3 thirteenths to make the absolute values here fairly close to 1. So in my case, you could take x of the order of 1. But you take x of the same order uh, as, as the bj's. I mean, it's not exactly equal, but it's of that order. In absolute value, you take some complex number. And so if this is x, then here I have beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3. Sorry, x would be, let's say, this. Then I have beta 1 plus x, beta 2 plus x, and beta 3 plus x, which might be here. And now you see that the betas had completely had the same absolute value. But I've shifted them, all three, by something of the same order as all of them. So now they have completely different order of magnitude. In my picture, this one has order of magnitude less than it used to be. It's gone inside the circle. This is almost what it was because I crossed a little. But this one's quite a bit bigger. But now I could turn the x. So what I did, just to run the program, uh, so I, I could show you the one line Pyre program. Here it is. I took my same test that I'd given him. I, I took that vector without knowing the answer. I tried x. And so I tried x to be e to the i 
t over 10, uh, i j over 10, and j was simply an integer, I went from 0 to 62, because 62 over 10 is slightly bigger than 2 pi. So I went around the circle. It doesn't matter exactly. And for each one, uh, what you do is the ideas of one of these is much bigger. If beta 1 plus x, let's say, is bigger than beta j plus x for j different from 1, so it's the biggest one, well, then, if n is big enough, this exponential term, remember, the beta j is the same size. This exponential term will completely dominate the others. So therefore, the a n tilde will be now a new number, which I called y, y1 to the n, times some new you know, c0 star plus c1 star over n. There'll be some new expansion to which I can apply the old method, uh, which means that I then take the ratio of two of these and do the old method with h. Now is h again. And so I did that, but first you have to see that, so I just took the ratio of the last two. So what you do is you take this x, and then for each one, we have this a n tilde, which for me n was 500, it was, well, it was 250, because remember we've only half as many. And I want the ratio, so I took the ratio of the last two that I had. And so here's the table of what happened, was here's j, and here's this yj, and remember y1 is supposed to be beta 1 times beta 1 plus x. So I can solve the quadratic equation. Uh, y, uh, x is the number I chose. y1 is the one that I got by taking this ratio. So this will be roughly y1. I solve the quadratic equation. So I take this thing, I call this number y1, and then I solve the quadratic equation, so x is this. And so I did this. So when j was 0, then I got as the answer 1.0058995. But when, sorry, that was, uh, sorry, this is j is zero. But then if I took one, two, three, four, one, two, three, but not four anymore, four didn't work, I got the same plus 10 to the minus. 9 times i, and then they got a little, so I had 4 that were almost exactly the same. And then the next one was quite a bit off, 0 0.935, and then number 5 was a completely different number. So as you took this, you know, going in steps of 10, four or five times it was this value and also to the left, and this was the best one. And so I can tell you the numerical values of beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3. Beta 1 is, of course, real, and it is 1.0058995. And this one is uh, 0.692307, something or other. I'm not going to write it out, plus 0.72975i. And here also there was, uh, I wrote it, there was an i as well. But now, so for 4, you got something that was neither uh, neither meat nor fish. But for 0 up to 3, it was very close to this. For 4, it was intermediate. But then from 5 all the way up to 25, it was almost the same. And then at 26, it was nonsense. Then it, it, it jumped around a lot. And eventually, as you went around the circle, you got some more that gave you a number you know, like this 6, 9. So now what you do is clear. You take the best one of these, which here was 0, because it was also minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. So this was the best one. Here you take the middle one between 5 and 25, so that's 15. And I take that sequence a and tilde, but now I don't just take the quotient and take the last value, but the whole vector and apply the usual extrapolation method. And so when I did that, uh, so then if I did extrapolation uh, using the parameter h equals 3, so much less than 8, and this was using x, j equals 0 in this thing, then that gave me, uh, of the B1 value, that's the first one, that gave me beta 1 plus about 2 times 10 to the minus 11. So it gave 11 digits. That's already very much enough to recognize it. And when you took the, the ones that were better, because there were many more values from 5 to 25, if I took the J equals 15 value and tried different ages than the one that gives the fastest convergence, now it turned out you could go up to 10. And then this gave me beta 2, and the error was now, I'm dropping the signs, 1 times 10 to the minus 27 plus uh, i, well, minus, it doesn't matter, plus i times 10 to the minus 27. So in other words, 
One of them got 11 digits, and one of them 27, very much enough to recognize algebraic numbers. But you see, it's not quite a method. There's not a well-defined thing. You have to do some trial and error. I tried 62 values, went around the circle, because I don't know where these betas are. But for some x of the rough order magnitude, one of them should be much bigger in absolute value than the others and should dominate. So it's a very, very nice idea, very much in the spirit of the other, but, uh, but vaguer, as he said himself. It's not a completely well-defined thing where you zero in. But once you have it, then you can zero in more and more, and it does work. Anyway, I wanted to tell that because it's kind of a success of the course. Maybe there'll be more that one of the people in the audience could, uh, could improve or could solve a new method or could solve a problem that I posed. Although in this case, although I'd forgotten, I'd told him about this problem long ago, and he had already told me the solution, but I'd somehow not internalized it. So apologies to Campbell. OK. So. That was uh, about the extrapolation method in a slight variant. But as you saw last time, as I mentioned now, with the cube roots and so on, there are many, many variants. Once you know the method, if you have a problem that doesn't 100% fit, you can usually massage it, tweak it, somehow and make it fit. But here it was, as I said, trickier. And I had actually not seen a good way to do it. I tried something similar, but just with a few terms. And it didn't work well at all. I never thought of taking you know, the age, so to speak, to be at the same order as n. And that uh, here worked very well. OK, so that was uh, the first round. OK, so I have several possible topics to do today. So in any case, I want to finish with all uh, side topics today and next time, Thursday, so that the last two weeks, the ones that will be Mondays and Wednesdays, I want to go, uh, give a specific thing in, much, in more detail, probably for the whole four lectures, which is an apl uh, application of the circle method to really explain the circle method of hardy Ramanujan, but in a new problem. Uh, well, the problem is not new. They had actually asked it, but in a situation that's much more complicated than the one they had. So before I go on with other subjects, I want to mention something that I've mentioned a couple of times, which is how do, I, how do you recognize numbers? So here there was already there were some algebraic numbers, like 3 plus square root of minus 10 times 3 thirteenths. If you have that with lots of decimals, in that case, uh, you can just ask Paris. I mean, many programs have that. There's, well, there's the famous LLL, lens for lens for lavash algorithm. And that is an algorithm to look for the shortest vector in a high dimensional lattice, so maybe a 20 dimensional lattice. So you have a quadratic form in 20 variables, and you look for integer arguments to make the quadratic form as small as possible, so the shortest vector. That is, it was developed for number theory, but it has many applications. One that even Leinster only found out by accident because they, the people who invented them never told the inventors of the method properly, they were afraid they'd ask for some royalties, and this was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. But GPS, uses the lens to the algorithm crucially. So if you're old enough to remember when GPS first was, came into use, actually originally it was only in the military. Then it became declassified, and a few people had it. It was very expensive, but a few taxi drivers, now everybody's got it on their phone. And it used to be that if they had GPS, and you said, can you take me to some village, you know, 100 miles from Dress, they could find the village. They certainly couldn't find the house. It was within, you know, 500 meters. And now, you know, they can bring you right up to the house. Probably they can see into your eye by now with the thing. And the improvement was not, it, it uses triangulation. There are various radio waves being bounced off. Satellites are sent by radio transmitters. And then you, 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 know, you know you can measure the strength of the signal, blah, blah, blah. And you work out how far you are. And you triangulate, but it's very approximate. But the idea, how you use lens for Lovash, is you send a radio wave which is bounced off, and then it interferes with itself. And so you can see whether it's interfering positively or negatively. And you know the frequency. So what you can find out is the distance from you to that far away point, the approximate distance in kilometers, which is what they used to use, but also the distance in wavelengths, but only multiple the wavelength. You don't know how many wavelengths are there. You just know it's in phase. But if you think about it, that exactly means wavelength is integral. It means you're in a high dimensional lattice. And so somebody, I don't know the details how it works, but somebody had the wonderful idea of using the LLL algorithm. So as I said, the problem there is find a short vector 
in some given lattice in R to the N, where R, R, N might be 10 or 15, I mean, not a million, but also not one or two. So you have to find a vector in some high dimensional space. Now, what's called in Paris Lindep, you put in the vector of, let's say, seven numbers to high precision. And then depth, you're going to look, are they linearly dependent? I mean, this is the Paris notation of that vector. You look, is there an integer linear combination which is very small? So for instance, if you give the numbers uh, one, so you have some number, and the actual truth is it's you know, 37 nineteenths uh, plus 52 nineteenths uh, times Euler's constant, if I'm taking random numbers, plus uh, you know, minus 11 nineteenths times e and something times pi. But, and you suspect that maybe x has something to do with the numbers x, 1, gamma, and e, which is x plus 1 in Paris, because as I mentioned, Paris doesn't even have e because it's not an important number. Oh, so you would just put this, do linear dependence. And here, even in very low precision, this is a trivial case with one-digit numbers, you would immediately find 19 minus 37 minus 52 and 11 as the output. So it will tell you that this vector of relatively small integers is essentially orthogonal to the input vector. Now, you don't have to know why, because it's just programmed Paris and in many other languages. But just out of curiosity, how can you use an algorithm to find a short vector in a high dimensional space to solve this? Does anyone know the trick? I could also ask, can you see the trick? But I sure wouldn't have thought of it. It's very simple. You take, you see, we want, here we want, well, this is not necessarily m. It's you know, some n. d is the dimension. We want n1 up to nd in z to the d, such that the sum ni, well, just this, nix to the i is very small. Very small. So we, we want, ideally, it should be 0. But of course, nothing is exact on the computer. And here, you want them not too big. Because of course, if you take even just 1 and pi, then we all know that there's some integer combination that is arbitrarily small. The integer linear combinations are dense. So you can make that smaller than 10 to the minus a million with numbers that have nothing to do with pi. You want the n n's not too big. But sometimes they are very big, because you have a sequence of numbers. And they might be you know, 10 digit numbers. And there might be seven of them. So then you'll need you know, a certain amount of accuracy. So the idea is very, very simple. You define a quadratic form. So you first take the sum of the nd squared. We're going to make that quadratic form as small as possible. So that'll guarantee that the nds are not too big. And then we add, remember, the xi are given. You just don't know what the, in an exact form. You take this linear form squared. That's a quadratic form. You multiply by 10 to the 50. That's a quadratic form. And now you make that as small as possible. Well, if that's small, let's say it's smaller than 10 to the uh, 15. Well, then, since both terms are positive, this is less than 10 to the 15. So every nd is less than 10 to the 7. So they aren't very big. But if this is less than 10 to the 15, then this is 10 to the minus 35. But that's the square. So it's, you've got 10 to the minus 18. So that's the simple trick. And of course, you can vary the power 10 to the 5th. But you put some very big number. And then, by the way, there's another thing. Well, you can also, in Paris, you can, if you have a real number, real or complex, and it's given numerically to very high precision, and you put the degree, d, that you expect. I mean, you do a test. I wonder if this is algebraic. Let's say I have degree at most 4. So you would put algebraic dependence of your number in 4. For instance, you could try algebraic dependence of pi, which in pi is called pi, and 4. And you can put a precision, or if you're working to 1,000 digits, it will assume you want to use all 1,000 digits. And then it will give you the best fifth, fourth degree polynomial that practically annihilates pi, but it'll have gigantic coefficients. And of course, this is just a special case, because an algebraic equation for number x, well, let's call it alpha, is just a, a linear combination with integer coefficients of 1 alpha up to alpha to the d. So this is a special case of Lindep. So you can recognize the linear dependence of different numbers are algebraic. So I, I wanted to talk very briefly today about this question. If somebody gives you a number, you found it with one of these asymptotic methods, and you have 50 or 100 digits, like we had this today for Atisha's problem. We have 100 digits. In this case, we know the answer in terms of theta series. And it's such a mess. Your chance of recognizing it as an algebraic number, if you don't know, would be 0. But very often, you can. And I wanted to give you one non-trivial example that I mentioned, I think, on the first day from my own work, but it's a paper with Martin Miller. Uh, that actually came up 
where, first of all, you had to find the number of high precision, and that's also not quite obvious. And then you had to recognize it, and that's not obvious. And so it's a fun example. It's not quite asymptotics, but it's very much in the spirit of what we're doing in this case. So this was a paper that we wrote on certain Teichmuller curves. And there, the, the Teichmuller curves gives you a linear differential equation. And in this case, it was a second-order equation. And so I can tell you what the equation was. I have two polynomials. A of t is uh, t times t minus 1. So I'm working. It turned out this was a particular example that was related. All Teichmuller curves have to do with the hilbert multer surface, which means some real quadratic field. Here it was q of squared of 17. And so everything is in terms of alpha. And then there was a fourth degree polynomial. The details don't matter. Even if you're taking notes, just put dot, dot, dot. It doesn't play any role at all. Uh, so let's call this t to the fourth minus beta t cubed plus beta t squared minus t. And here, beta is uh, lambda is uh, 31 minus 7 squared of 17 over 2. And they're just essentially random numbers. And beta is lambda plus lambda inverse plus 1, which is whatever it is. And, there'll be a, and the gamma, I don't have gamma yet, but I will in a second is 27 minus 5 squared of 17 over 4. Just to say that these numbers are explicit, so we have one polynomial of degree 4 and another polynomial of degree 2, which doesn't play any role at all, but it is, but I might as well give it, just so you see it's explicit, and that we don't possibly have enough information about this that we can guess anything just by eyeballing it. I mean, the problem is much too complicated. So here are two polynomials, and the differential equation is L y equals 0, where L is the differential operator, d by dt times this polynomial a of t times d by dt plus the second polynomial. This is standard form for second order differential equations. You should basically always try to write them that way. OK, which you can't always do, but after renormalizing, you can. OK, so that was the differential operator. And so there are two solutions. L of y equals L of y squared the star equals 0. So y is given by a power series of which we have lots of terms. And you just put an unknown power series. You can normalize. It's linear. Start with 1. And then you just insert it into the differential equation. And you can find you know, the first 500 coefficients. And similarly, y star is y. There's a double. The exponents of this equation are, uh, are equal. And so there's a log term. So the second term is log t times the first term plus a new power series. And the new power series, you can always subtract a multiple of this thing. So we can assume it starts with 0, and we do. And then the next term is, it doesn't matter at all what it is. It's, it's this over uh, 64t. Now comes the point. So this, this was the particular uh, differential equation we had. And now what we were trying to understand, and we knew it actually had to be true for abstract reasons, then there must be a multiple parameterization. And we actually knew what the group was. So what that means is that you have z, or tau, call it z or z. It's easier to write. z in the upper half plane. And then we're going to have f of z is a multiple form, but still unknown of weight 1, because it's a second order of equation, where sixth order would be weight 5, in z. So you know what a multiple form is, and I won't repeat, with respect to a certain group gamma, which we know. And this group gamma does not contain 1, 1, 0, 1, this SL2, but it does contain translation by alpha and then some other generators. So we know that this multiple form will have a Fourier expansion, unknown as some sum a n, q to the n, where q will be e to the 2 pi i times z over alpha, because it has to be periodic. So we know there'll be a q expansion. We don't know what the ans are. We don't know what f of z are, because we don't know what z is. But there's going to be, and there's supposed to be also a modular function. So remember what that means. That means that if a, b, c, d is in my group gamma, then f, so let's call it gamma, then f of gamma z, which is a z plus b over c z plus d, is c z plus d times f of z. The t of gamma z is simply t z, is simply t of z. So what we know is that, and then uh, y, if you substitute of t of z, 
That has to be f of z. That's what it means to parameterize a linear differential equation with modular forms. So we can find this, this, param this thing as a power series of t to as many terms you want. You just put in unknown coefficients, put the different differential equation. If it gives a recursion, you solve, you can get you know, a few hundred coefficients. It's a linear equation. Of course, the coefficients will be in q squared of 17 because everything is in q squared of 17. But now we want to find this f. So the method in classical cases where you know that this multiple form in SL2c is very nice. There are always, in this case, the two exponents are always equal. So one, of, one solution is y, and the other, I erased it, but the two solutions here, y is holomorphic, and y star is y log t plus y1, which is again holomorphic, so power series. OK, and I gave it the first few terms. So that means that since those two series, but sorry, what we know is that the two series here are the two solutions of this equation will be f of z and the other one, well, some other one, but not necessarily the one you have, will be y star. That's exactly how the differential equation looks. The two uh, independent solutions are a multiple form of weight one and z times the multiple form. And so the whole lattice they span is f of z times mz plus n. And that's just right. When you apply the multiple group, that becomes the monodromy group of the differential equation. And the modularity helps you make everything work. So then you see how that works. Now that means that z is equal to y star over y, which is therefore some well-known, some explicit polynomial. In, well, it's log t uh, plus a polynomial, which starts uh, a power series, I mean. 439 minus whatever that number was, 97 squared of 17 over 64 t, etc. So y star over y is going to be our z. And so the q should be e to the 2 pi i z. So it should be, well, let me take capital Q to be e to the y star over y. Well, that will be t because the log, uh, and then plus the exponential of this will be 439 minus 97 squared of 6, 17 over 64 t squared. Of course, the later coefficients are different, but you can compute 100 decimals. So here is the expansion of q, which is the thing we're looking for, the e to the 2 pi tau in terms of t. And of course, you can easily invert this, since you get minus the same number. And again, you have hundreds of coefficients. Now, in the good cases that I knew from earlier work, like Fritz Berker's wonderful work on the Apiri proof for z of 3, this q really was the little q. It was e to the 2 pi z. The group is SL2z. And then you just get the power series. This is the usual q expansion of a multiple function. And if you know many multiple functions, maybe you can recognize it. And in that case, it was a quotient of eta function. It was very easy to recognize. And you get then, by substituting into f, you get the power series of f of z as a q series. And it's a multiple form, a very small weight. It's easy to recognize. So that's how you do it. In practice, if you believe that your differential equation has a multiple parameterization, then you take the two solutions of the differential equation. One is holomorphic. One is a log term. Call them y and y star. Exponentiate y star over y. Call that q. That is an invertible power series, because y star over y starts with log t. So when you exponentiate, it starts with t. So you can insert. And now, then you get that y, which is a power series of t, which is supposed to be f of z, was also y of t becomes some explicit, you know, a n q to the n. The only problem with that is we don't know that the z we want is really this z. It could be some other z. And so what happens when you do this is that this q is actually a constant, but we don't know what the constant is times the real q. So the real q, remember, is it's written here is e to the 2 pi z over alpha, and only with that z. So z is alpha over 2 pi i times log q. Only with that z will the group act on z. Otherwise, it just won't work. But capital Q is the one that we do know. Little q, we don't. So there's a constant. And the question is, how can you find this constant? So the original idea was the little q, of course, if z is in the upper half plane, then q, which is e to the 2 pi i z over a real number, is, of course, in the unit disk. And so the sum a n q to the n has radius of convergence 1, always, for any multiple form. But now it's q to the n is the ones we actually have. And so the radius of convergence will be absolute value of a inverse, because this is the scaling factor. 
So now what you can do is you can take the first 500 coefficients of this thing, make a very rough guess at the radius of convergence by taking the nth root of the nth term, and well, one over that and taking the limit. But unfortunately, these coefficients are quite regular. They have a nice recursion. But after this change of variables, they're very irregular. So you, you, get a, you can kind of eyeball and you get two digits. And we found that roughly A was roughly 7.5. But you can't recognize the number that you only have to two decimals. And on top of it, even if A is real, which we didn't even know, uh, but even if it turned out it is, it could be positive or negative. It turned out to be negative. I mean, the radius of convergence will only tell you up to sign. And so there's a tiny trick here which is actually irrelevant uh, because it's not part of the story I'm telling here. If somebody wants to ask, I can say it takes two minutes. But uh, this is just a uh, radius of convergence, so limit as n goes to lim inf of a n to the 1 over n gives me that absolute value of a is roughly 7.5. But there's a small trick that you can use, and you turn it into something with exponential rapidity, so better uh, using what you know about the multiple form in this case. It's completely irrelevant. We could compute this, and this one I'll actually write out just for fun. So this is not just 1, uh, 1, 4, 1, 1, 4, 5, 5, 6, 6, 2, 3, 2, uh, 1, 1. OK, so that's, I think, 50 digits or anyway, some large number of digits. And now the question is, what the hell is that number? And so in the paper it's written, after some trial and error, we can recognize this number in closed form. But it was still a question mark. But later, we had analysis, and it turned out it was indeed correct. This number is. Two, well, that's not very hard to guess. Three plus square root of 17, okay, that's a number in our quadratic field of norm uh, eight or minus eight, so that's not so bad. And then there is five minus square root of 17 over two, that's also not so bad, it's got norm two, it's a prime, but it was to the power 17 minus one over four. <laughs> so, you know, that's really much harder to recognize. And, uh, but with some trial and error, we figured out, well, I figured out, of course, I'm the guy who loves numbers, uh, that it had to be that. And the conviction that it is that is once you've found this as a possibility, you compute it, you only need eight digits to find that. But then you compute them all, and they all agree. So you really know it's true. Okay, In all numerical things, that's a good way. Don't use all the information you have. Use half of it to make a prediction. And then use the prediction to compute the other half, and then check. Because you'll feel much more if you've predicted 20 digits, you know the chance of doing that at random is 10 to the minus 20. Whereas if you use them all, you never know if you cheat it. So it's, it's always a good idea. So just very briefly, how do you do this? Well, it's not that hard. We're in Q of squared. Of, there, I, I did allow, I think, at the post that there might be a pi somewhere. But for various reasons, I thought that this should be of the four algebraic numbers or products of algebraic numbers to algebraic powers. And the only field is Q of squared of 7. And so the numbers here, so you, it means you should take the log. So log of a, well, without the minus sign, would be a combination of log 2, log of this, and log of this. But the combination itself would be not just an integer combination, but also a square root of 17. But then you can assume that the numbers here are small, and the only interesting prime here, except for 17, was 2. So you could look for the prime factors. I mean, two actually factors is pi pi prime. And so all of these involve only 2 pi and pi prime. So if you look here at the log of absolute value of a and at the log of pi 2 and the log of pi 2 prime, and then you apply and uh, n squared of 17 times the log of pi 2 and square root of 17 times the log of pi 2 prime, that's only five numbers. And so now you ask Lindep, and, and you immediately get tiny numbers, and, and they're these. But if you didn't think of doing that, that it may be you'd have powers which themselves are in cubic square root of 7, you'd never find. So the moral is not you know, how clever we were. We had some reasons to know that. But the moral is one can recognize numbers, even complicated numbers, but only if one has an idea what type of number they'll be. So another problem I mentioned in an earlier lecture, the individual numbers turned out to be polynomials with small rational coefficients in pi squared. So they themselves were not easy to recognize. They were a combination of 1 pi squared and pi to the fourth. But if you know that and you have it lots of this, you use linear dependence. So the idea is it's always a combination of thinking, knowing your problem, and having enough digits that, that when you find it, it's unique. And then you use these two things from Paris or some other program, linear dependence and algebraic dependence. 
So, uh, because people often think it's complete magic. How can you possibly know this? But you always have to have an idea. You, there's no algorithm that would, if I just give you this number even to 1,000 digits, that'll tell you this is what it is. But if you know our problems connect with Q of squared of 17 and could have algebraic numbers to algebraic powers, then you can quite easily uh, guess. And even if there'd been a few more factors, we could have put in a couple, of, a couple more primes, log of some other primes of Q squared of 17, multiplied by 1 squared of 17. We would have equally found it, because we had enough digits that even if we had 10 unknown uh, inputs, we could find the right combination. But if you don't know what 10 things to try, you will never find it. So that was kind of my uh, you know, lesson about what you can do and what you can't do. OK, so that was kind of meant to be fun. Well, now I wanted to talk about two more topics, but the second one I was sure I wouldn't uh, be able to finish. But in fact, I'm not even sure anymore I'll finish the first. But I'll try to, because although it's fun, uh, first of all, it's actually published. And it's even in Paris. It's pre-programmed, so you don't have to know how it works. But it's fun. And also, it was co-discovered by five people, uh, one of whom is a big here of mine, it's Euler. One is von Weinhardt, and I didn't, don't know if it's uh, capital or not. It's capital. This was, I, I don't I didn't, the uh, reference isn't given, but it would be maybe in the 50s. Or, anyway, it's many years ago, certainly before our time. The next person is Henri Cohen, who's a very old friend of mine and the inventor of Paris. Well, he, he's also a very good number theorist. The next is our colleague, Fernando Rodriguez Villegas, I won't write it out because he's right here and everybody knows when the last one was me. So it wasn't quite teamwork. We never worked together. Euler did his thing long ago and invented what's basically the essence of the algorithm, but in a way that if you try to do it algorithmically on the computer, it would never work. But of course, he didn't care. There weren't any computers anyway. It was a theoretical consideration how you could understand something. Then von Weinhardt, as I say, is of the rough time, I think just after World War II, I don't remember anymore. Uh, made something that you can implement that works, and it's in books on numerical analysis, but it's not as efficient as the final one. And then Henri Cohen, who made Paris, wanted to implement it, and when he did that, then he found an improvement. And then I forget whether he was visiting Bordeaux and showed it to Fernando, or Fernando was visiting Trieste, and he showed it to him. But anyway, Henri showed it to Fernando, who then found a further improvement. And then I visited one of them. They're both old, very old friends. And they showed me, and I found yet another improvement. And so we wrote a little paper uh, together. So the paper is uh, something like 1998 uh, doing this. And it's cute, not at all important, and not really new, but it is fun. So the, the method, which is now, uh, we always called it sum alt, and there's now actually a thing in Paris called sum alt. And the problem is uh, compute to high accuracy accurately, fast, and with uh, minimal storage. So you don't need a lot of numbers. You don't need a big computer. I mean, a lot of uh, space, disk space. Uh, the value of an infinite series, well, it's a sum with alternating terms. Now, it turns out, actually, they don't have to alternate. You pretend they alternate. And for the proof, they will have to alternate. But then we apply it to other functions, but they don't exactly alternate. And it still very often gives, you know, we apply it to functions that we know the exact answer. It often works anyway. But it's meant to be for alternating terms. So we'll write the sum. Uh, and by the way, it could even diverge. So a theorem that we all know from uh, you know, beginning, very beginning analysis is that if the AKs are all positive numbers and tend to zero, it doesn't matter how slowly, then this something, the alternating sum will always converge to something, but it can be very slow. And the question is to compute it to high accuracy. So let me first tell you the bottom line, which is how good it is. So, uh, so we want to compute. Uh, so we, have, we know n values, or we can compute the first n values. So n might be you know, 200. And we won't use just that data, so just the first 200 coefficients, a0 to a uh, 199, and then predict the, the value of this infinite series as accurately as possible. And for a large class of functions, uh, we can show that the formula we will get actually is, is the unique best one. So I can say 
roughly, the, I'll write the algorithm in a second, but the accuracy, relative accuracy, of course, if you multiply the series by a million, it, since it's linear, you just, so it's relative accuracy, meaning the, the size of the error compa compared to the size of S. For a very big class of functions, which I'll write down in a second, of, uh, of sequences, is always the same. It's universal. It's 5.328 to the minus n. I and mean, this is an exact number. So if you have, let's say, 500 terms of your series, but you have them to high accuracy, maybe they're exact or to very high accuracy, but you only have 500 terms, then you can get 5.3 to the minus 500 is the accuracy. So if I turn that around, i.e., you get, you need approximately n to be roughly 1.31 times capital K to get K decimal digits. So if you want, for instance, 100 digits, then you need about 130 terms, independently of the function. That's very amusing. It's always the same speed of convergence. The time, OK, the storage space is O of 1. And it's a universal O of 1. It's actually six numbers. So you might say, wait a second, if I have 500 numbers, don't I have to have a vector of the 500 numbers? No, of course you have to be able to find the first five, but you might have an algorithm, and the algorithm might not be recursive. It might be recursive, then you have to make a table, and then you have to store, although 500 numbers is nothing. Five million numbers is doable on the computer, and you'll never have five million numbers. But in fact, we only have to store six, because actually we'll use each AK only once. So even if AK is given by some function, A of K, that is computable for given k. As k goes from 0 to 200, you can compute it each time until it's too slow and you're getting annoyed. And you don't even have to save it. We'll use each value just once and then throw it away. So Henri Cohn called that using them on the fly, like you know, catching a fly ball. So the storage is O of 1. You can't beat O of 1. The accuracy, you can hardly beat uh, you know, the number of digits. It's simply linear in the number of terms. And finally, the what's the last thing that we one storage space accuracy of the time. So this is universal. It's also universal O of 1 per value read in. So we're going to have a loop where k will go from 0 to n minus 1. As that's the number of terms you have. For each k, you have to compute that one. That might take a long time. But the, but the time of the computation is O of 1. It's like three multiplications and two divisions. So it's simply, so basically, the time of computation is exactly comparable to the time to read in the series. So if somebody has pre-computed them and gives you a vector, then the time here is O of just the time to read the vector. If you don't read the vector, you'll never be able to give the answer. So it's, it really can't be bettered up to maybe the value of the O constant. And the algorithm itself is not uh, too complicated. So I'll write it in kind of semi-code, but it's, if you know Pari, it's almost Pari. So here's the algorithm. So remember what I'm assuming is we have these numbers a of k. So this is something that my computer is capable of computing. And n might be, for instance, 200. So n is the number of terms we're going to use. So I'm going to use this for k from 0 up to n minus 1. I'm going to use the first n values. And so the algorithm, it is uh, only two steps. The first is in initialization. You first take d to be 3 plus the square root of 8 to the nth power. It's a very weird algorithm. Why on earth would you start with 3 plus the square root of 8 and then take it to the nth power? It looks completely crazy. And actually, we won't use this because I'll then replace d. But since I'll never use this one again, I can call the new thing d. So I'm using, actually, Pari syntax. I replace d by d plus 1 over square root of d. This will remain. And this is an integer. And of course, it is roughly, since square root of 8 is 2.8, uh, it'll be roughly 5.8, just the number we just saw, to the nth. Unlike the 4.8 in my problem with Emmanuel, where we had 2 plus the square root of 8, which was 4.8. And this is 5.8. OK, so this is fixed. And then I'm going to have three more numbers, uh, which I'm going to compute in a loop. And their initial values, they're going to be called uh, uh, b, c, and s. And the initial value of s is simply 0. The initial value of c is this minus d, which I'll never change. This d will survive. But b, c, and d, so they will, uh, they're, they're going to, this is the initial values. And now the algorithm, you'll see it's really short, it's universal. 
For k, I'll use Paris notation. So this means we do a loop. For k equals 0, you do what is written right after. Then for k equals 1, you do it until n minus 1, and then you're finished. So for each one, we're going to update uh, the original value of c, then the original value, then the value of s, and then the value of b in turn. So c will be b minus c. So you know in any computer language, certainly in Paris, this doesn't, it's not a mathematical statement that c equals b minus c, meaning that b is 2c. It means you already had the value of b and c, and you now set c equal to the difference of what was previously b and c. So that's, uh, you know, but that's in many, many languages. But if you've never done computer programming, then you might find that confusing because it looks like inequality, but it's actually setting it equal. Then you increase s by a of k. So s, sorry, I've left out something. There must be a, a b, c times a of k. So let me correct it from the, yeah, c times a of k. If I just put a of k, then of course at the end, my s would just be the original sum, and that wouldn't make sense at all. So c is a of k, OK? And then, no, a of k is what, oh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, your uh, a k is, I'm now, this was a vector, but I'm assuming it's, it's a function. Uh, but of course, it could also be a vector. Then you just read in the vector. So a k are the sum ends without the sign. Excuse me. I'd, I'd put the a k, but I hadn't put that it's meant to be equal. So it's, I could write a k, but if you know Paris, well, actually, in Paris, you can't put c times either, as you can. You have to put a star for multiplication. It won't lie, allow you. And also, if it's actually Paris, you don't have a square root sign. You have to put, as in tech, square root of 8. But I don't think that would really bother anyone. The rest is, is pure Paris it's, as it stands. Here, you need the star. But a of k, I, I can't call it a sub k because it doesn't have k. I could put a vector, but then it should be k plus 1 because pi vectors start with 1. So let's just pretend it's a function. And then finally, I'm going to update b. And that I won't write in pi form because it's too much of a nuisance. I'll put what it actually is. So n remembers our fixed number, 200. k is going from 0 to n minus 1. You have the factor k plus n times k minus n over k plus 1 times k plus a half. And you multiply b by that. And then, well, you could put it on one line in Paris, but you could at the end with the semicolon, but you can just, just output uh, s, the sum, and you, you normalize by this number d. And that's the answer. So what this will do for you is for given n, you see, it doesn't matter what the a of k are. I mean, it doesn't care what a of k are. They're just unknown numbers, a0 to a k. So if you fix n, like 5, then it'll be some fixed rational linear combination of the first five values, and it's the one that's supposed to give you the best guess, guesstimate of what the infinite alternating sum will be if you go to infinity. So that is, and that's what it does. So it's quite fun that you, know, you have this uh, strange number dn. So where do I have a little table of numbers right here? So here for n equals 1, 2, 3, and 4. So if I have 1, I have only one term. And even there, it gives an estimate. It tells you you should take 2 thirds of the first term. See, a0 is too big, because after a0, you're going to be subtracting positive things. But a0 over 2 is too small. If you had to guess, you would say if there's a single number. But obviously, to try to estimate an infinite sum using just one term is kind of a little. Uh, OK, the next term is 16a0 uh, minus 8a1 divided by 17. So I'll put the denominator in front. The next, so this uses two values, a0 and a1. The next one is 1 over 99 times 98a0 minus 80a1 plus 32a3. And the fourth one is 1 over 577 times 576a0 minus 544a1 plus 384a2 minus 128a3. So that's using the first four values. And what you see immediately is that what this denominator is the big number. That was our d, which is growing like 5.8 to the 3. So already for n equals 4, it's already 577. The, the coefficient of a0 is just one less. And this is exponentially big. So it's very, very close to a0. Well, it's got to be. The series is supposed to be in the limit, a0 minus a1 and so on. But you're just 
throwing away all the terms after the nth and trying to replace them by an intelligent combination. Similarly, the next coefficient, this is quite a bit less than 576, but it's only 30, that's only 5% less. So roughly, this is something like 0.998, A0, minus 0.95 times A1, and the next term is much further from 1. But if you take n equals 20, then the first three or four terms would be very close to 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1. After all, that's what it has to be in the limit. But the point is you're only using some tiny number of terms, like here only four. You have a very non obvious linear combination. You compute, then there is a closed formula, but you don't even need the closed formula for these coefficients c because you compute it inductively. Each c is b minus c, and b you compute inductively by this. The s has nothing to do with it, but those are the coefficients c to give the linear combination. So in this case, this would be the first c. This would be the set, well, maybe the sign. These would be the c's. 576, 544, 384, and 128. And the 577 is the d that we computed at the beginning that you have to divide by. OK. Actually, you don't even have to keep d. You could, if you want to have even less storage, you could throw away d as well uh, and just put c as minus this. Because in fact, D, as I told you, is always one bigger than the final C. But that's so silly that don't worry about it. OK, so that's uh, the algorithm. And now let me, I still have uh, several minutes. Let me first state it. In, uh, well, this is written as a computer algorithm. But of course, it's completely incomprehensible in the sense that even if you don't know Paris, you can easily imagine that the computer has no trouble adding square root of 8 to 3, taking the nth power taking that plus 1 over d over 2, especially if you know it's an integer, you can even round it off. This, like Fibonacci numbers, it's an integer. Minus 1 minus d and 0 is trivial. And then you see that n times, I have to do three operations, which involve one subtraction, one multiplication, one division, uh, four additions and subtractions, two multiplications, one div two multiplications. In other words, just a O of 1, like 10 arithmetic operations, just the four elementary operations. And then you have all of your numbers. So it's, as I promised, very, very short. The program itself is one line, one line for initialization, one line for the loop, and then zero lines, I mean, if in Paris. In Paris, you, at the end of the thing, you have to put a semicolon. I just put S over D, then I don't need that line. So that's the whole program. Uh, you, you can put a semicolon here. So you read in this, you have this line, and you output S over D. So now let me write it in more mathematical form, and then I'll give the proof, and that will exactly fill up today, and then I'll talk about highly divergent series next time. OK, so here's the actual, uh, what we called it a proposition, because theorem seemed, I guess, too big a word. It's easy enough. So for a given, for integers, I'll copy this straight from the paper. n and k, so remember n is the number of terms we're going to have, and k is going to go from 0 to n. Actually, I think only to n minus 1. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. Uh, you define rational numbers. dn is the one that I already told you, so it's 3 plus the square root of 8 to the n plus 3 minus the square root of 8 to the n over 2. So this is in z. And then c and k will also be an integer. And there are two different formulas for it. It's minus 1 to the k times this limiting value dn. Remember, c0 was dn minus 1. So here you have the sum m from 0 to k, n over n plus m. I'll try to write neatly. Uh, binomial coefficient n plus m over 2m, 2 to the 2m. And there's another formula for it which is also minus 1 to the k. And now you take, if you sum this from 0 to n, you would have the whole sum. And so I could also go from k plus 1 to n of the same thing. So those are the closed formulas. But this is bad in that it's nice for a mathematician to write a closed formula. But this takes longer to compute. You need all these big binomial coefficients. These c and k satisfy recursion. And the recursion is the one written here. It's much faster to compute. Now, it's, this for each k would be roughly O of k, so O of n terms, and binomial coefficients of so another n. So now, and we have to do it for every k up to n. And then we have n terms and another n. Even if, if you don't store the binomial coefficients, you're talking about n cubed. Uh, operations. Here, remember, we had 10 operations. It was O of n to the 0. It was just 
a subtraction. Uh, this is even irrelevant. Uh, three multiplications and, and division. So it was really, and a couple of additions. So th it's much more efficient. But this is the closed form, OK? And then, as I told you, the approximation. So S, remember, remember the problem. I'll, I'll, oh, it's still written here. No, it isn't. I raised it. So remember, the problem was we're given the, the numbers AK. And the AK should be nice enough. And in the proof, I'll say exactly what I mean by nice. And now my approximation, well, you already know because I just gave you the algorithm, is that we uh, wait from 0 to n minus 1. We wait the AKs uh, without the minus 1 to the K because these things themselves will tend to minus 1 to the K, as you saw there. You just wait the, C, uh, the A's by C over D, but it's easier to first take the integer and then divide at the end an integer by another integer. Well, it's only an integer if the AKs are integers. So this is the thing, but I haven't yet the proposition. This is all definitions, OK? And then the theorem is, then for AK nice, and I'll say in a second what it is for the proof. Uh, so the sequence has a good property, but as I already mentioned, many sequences don't. And the method still works fine. And sometimes we understood why. And sometimes, to be honest, we didn't really. But it's, it does. But then the relative error. is always less than or equal to 1 over dn, which is, remember, this number, this universal number, which is growing like 5.8 to the n. So not to say, it, and this is not, oh, this is actually true. So s minus sn is always less than or equal to absolute value of s divided by dn. So it's uh, even with no O cons. It's simply true uh, in, if it's a nice sequence. And most of the sequence one encounters are nice in that sense. But if they aren't, then. Uh, then the proof doesn't necessarily apply, but the algorithm is still there. It's programmed. Anyway, you can write this. It takes less than a minute to, to just type that into Paris. You don't have to anymore because some alt is now a command. You can just call it. But originally, I used it for years before it was there. And it's, you know, I did store it somewhere. It was, it's a one-line program. So I don't can erase all of this uh, advertising about how fast and how little storage and so on. So here's what does nice mean, and something that analysts will certainly like. AK is the kth moment so it should be a positive measure on zero one. So in other words, you have AK is the integral from 0 to 1, x to the k, d mu. And d mu is a measure if you, uh, greater than or equal to 0, which unless it's some singular measure, which it won't be, but for the theorem it doesn't matter, it'll just be some non-negative function, maybe a smooth positive function, times dx. So you know it might be w of x dx. Well, it's always w of x, but this could be a distribution now, or a measure. But roughly, it's, it's a positive function times dx. OK? So now I'll give the proof. And for the proof, I'm going to make a sequence of polynomials. But first, I'll just assume I have some sequence. And then I'll tell you how you pick the sequence. So we're going to have, so here's the proof. It's not at all long. But I do have to look at my notes because I, want, well, I, could, I did copy it into my handwriting so I could look at my handwritten notes. It would look better. We're, we'll, have, we'll, have, we'll choose a sequence of polynomials which will be chosen nicely in, in a moment, the sequence of polynomials, uh, Pn of x. OK? The number dn, which for the particular choice I'm going to make, is going to be that dn. But for, the, for most of the proof, it doesn't matter. I could have any sequence of polynomials. And then the method will work. dn will always be the value of Pn at minus 1. OK? And so. Uh, and the CN, remember that the CNK went from 0 to n minus 1, actually. They're given, you take PN of x and you subtract it from PN of minus 1. That's still a polynomial of degree n. Sorry, I didn't say of, of degree PN is, is n. So I have a sequence of polynomials of degree exactly n, so they span the space of polynomials. DN is going to be the value of 
at minus 1. The only thing I will definitely need is that it's non-zero. But for our sequence, it's going to be that you know, 5 plus, uh, well, that number, which is certainly not 0. So now this is polynomial degree n. If I subtract it for this, then it's still degree n. But now it vanishes when x is minus 1. So I can divide by 1 plus x. And these are the coefficients. So that's the intelligent way to say what dn and cnk are. For the particular polynomials I'm going to choose, it's going to be this. And from that, you can reconstruct the polynomial, but it's not the right way to, to do it. OK? So now, let's just look at, at the proof. So now, if I take Sn, which is by definition the sum So I'm going to define Sn as what the algorithm says I'm supposed to do. I take my n terms, I weight them with these Cnk, and I divide the sum by dk. Well, according to what I've just done, then you can see that this is 1 over dn, because I put that in front. And dn, remember, is pn of minus 1. And then I'm going to integrate pn of minus 1 minus pn of x divided by 1 plus x dx. Because the c and k are exactly the moments of that, and a k is the most, sorry, not dx, d mu. Remember that a k is x to the k d mu. And so if I take this times d mu and integrate, I will get the sum c and k, a k. But the sum c, but that is the integral of this thing, d mu. So that's, that's that formula. So you see it's very easy. Well. But because of this, you see that the actual sum we want, which is the sum from 0 to infinity, minus 1 ak, is simply the integral from 0 to 1, d mu over 1 plus x. Because the sum of minus 1 to the k, x to the k for x between 0 and 1 is just 1 over 1 plus x. That's kind of obvious. So therefore, the first term is pn of minus 1 times the integral d mu over 1 plus x, which is s. And then there's an error term. And you see that the error term is less than or equal to mn divided by this dn, which, well, absolute value, but let's say it's positive, times s. Well, I can put absolute values everywhere. Well, m will be positive. And mn is just the maximum of the nth polynomial on the interval, absolute value on the interval from 0 to 1. Because in the second integral, this is bounded by its maximum. The integral d mu over 1 plus x now everything is positive, and so that is my s. So that's why it's the relative error. This is the maximum, then I have to divide by pn of minus 1. So now, OK, now finally I say what the polynomial is. And so finally, the choice of the polynomial, that's very fun. So you choose, uh, you write cosine of 2nt. That's an even polynomial with period pi. Uh, and so you can write it as a polynomial in sine squared of t. And that's going to be my pn. So if you know your Chebyshev polynomials, pn of x is the, there are two Chebyshev polynomials, s and t, and one of them is called t, and uh, pn is just that one. So that's just a change of uh, the same shift that we used a few days ago, remember, for 1 minus 2x, two, two your integral for Gegenbauer. These are orthogonal polynomials. So pn of x is an orthogonal family for something simply because the these. But now it's clear that mn is simply 1. Because if, if t, I mean, as t reads over the real number, sine squared t goes from 0 to 1. And this is cosine. Its absolute value is bounded by 1. So we know that the mn is 1, and that gives the estimate I told that the error is uniformly divided by s over dn, which is just what I claimed. Now dn is easy because dn, remember, is defined as pn of minus 1. But if you have sine squared t is minus 1, then sine of t is equal to plus or minus i. And so you can uh, now compute the uh, cosine of 2n times that, and you get a form that you find exactly dn. And it's a one-line computation. So that is the dn. So for this particular polynomial, the maximum is trivial. It's 1, because the function itself, its values on the interval are cosine of something. So it's a function that will look like this. Uh, the dn will be exactly the one I told you. And finally, the cnk. Remember, I talked about uh, orthogonal polynomials, and I told that they always satisfy recursion. Here, the recursion 
is this. Remember, the recursion was always that the n plus first polynomial is a linear function of x times the nth plus a constant times the n minus first. So here's the recursion. And actually, that's all you need. This one is the one that would give the recursion of the algorithm. And then you can also write down the formulas that Pn of x by standard formulas for uh, uh, Chebyshev polynomials, you can write it down. And it happens to be this, but it doesn't really matter, times uh, 4x to the m. So this is a closed formula, and then that would give the closed formula I wrote in the proposition. But as I said, it's much easier to use the recursion. So you see, the proof is very simple. The whole thing is simple. But the fun thing is that it's incredibly fast, that it's completely uniform. Whatever function you put in, it always has the same speed of convergence. Like if you have n terms like 1 over 5.8 to the n, so 5.8 is logarithmically 70% of, of 10. So you need n only a little bigger than the number of digits you're, you're aiming for. As I said, if you, if you want 100 digits, you take 130 terms. So in the paper, we gave a couple of numerical examples. And since I still have eight minutes left, I'll just give them as sample pr uh, problems. But you can use this, obviously, for anything. And the first two will be straight applications that actually had come up. Some, you know, One needed the values of those sums. And they were very slowly convergent. So, and so the first one is the sum, the product, n from 1 to infinity, of gamma of 1 plus 1 over 2n minus 1 divided by gamma of 1 plus 1 over 2n. So if you think about this, this is just the product gamma of 1 over 1 plus k to the plus or minus 1. If you take the log, it's an alternating sum. But it's quite slow to compute because gamma, let me finish the sentence and then I'll answer. Gamma of 1 plus epsilon, of course, you can compute to high accuracy, but it takes a little time. It's a transcendental function. Then you take the log. And so if you applied the method and we give a few digits, it doesn't matter at all what they are. But if you wanted 1,000 digits and you took this product, it, it wouldn't work at all. Uh, well, this one, the way I've written it now, is positive, and you could use euler maclaurin or many other things. So this completely regular, you don't really need it. But this, so sorry, I, I wanted to give two examples, but Emmanuel had a question. On. So my question is, so if one was interested in, in, in getting the, in the best possible error term, in the sense that the, to, to get the maximum possible value of this dn, so I guess my question is with regards to the optimality of this choice. OK, of the I'll try to answer polynomial afterwards, P. but that's the previous thing. Let me come back to that. At the, I wanted to give three examples, and I'm in the middle. Okay. I gave one, and it's kind of uh, you know, it's, it is a distraction. I'm just going to it'll take two minutes, and then I'll come back. But the paper is published. It's on my website. And we do discuss there are two variants of the method. The, this is certainly the optimal one, I think, if you're exactly in this class of functions that would be. It depends how much you know. You could have a function that has some other behavior, like the measure you might know is very big at the left or on the right. In the paper, we discuss uh, other variants. And there are two others, I think we call them algorithms A, B, and C. I didn't even look them up anymore. This is 20 years ago. And they work somewhat better in the same situation or better in a more general situation or in a situation where these hypotheses are not satisfied. So there is some discussion. But I think for a very large class, uh, the numbers, well, I erased the little table, but starting with 2 thirds are kind of optimal. So as far as I know, if you say, Don, I only know four terms of a series. It's alternating, but I, I, I expect it to be fairly regular. Just from these four terms, can you predict the, the value of minus 1 to the k, a k? Then I think it will be the one that I said, starting with 576 over 577 a 0 and so on. So if, anyway, for a very large class, it is optimal. In this thing, you can see that if I assume that I'm doing it this way with the polynomial, and I'm taking p of minus 1, then there's no better polynomial than Chebyshev. That's easy, because Chebyshev keeps hitting the maximum many times. So it, it is pretty much, but, but the paper, the, I, I'm not an expert, and I don't remember even what we did to it at the time. But there is a discussion. And the answer is you can sometimes improve it. So sometimes there's a variant which gives better accuracy than 5.8, so bigger exponential. And secondly, there is a, a, a variant which maybe gives a less good exponential, but work, works for a bigger class of functions. So there are certainly lots of variants. And we didn't spend a lot of time. Again, unless it's a question about this example, can I wait till I finish the three examples? Because I'm, so to speak, in the middle of a very long sentence, which is to give three typical examples, A, B, and C, what we actually call them A, B, and C although there's no reason. The next actually came up in somebody's paper. 
connected with the kitchen, kitchen's constant, you take the dial logarithm, which is, again, a nuisance to compute. I mean, the dial logarithm is a transcendental function. And again, I'm not going to write out the value, but again, you can, anyway, only have eight value, eight digits, but you could give, give a thousand digits in, so to speak, no time at all. And the third example, I don't know why I call them A and B, because the third is not C. The third is, let's say, the Riemann zeta function, where, of course, Euler did it. But that's not alternating, but of course, we know the trick. If I take, instead of, well, since I want to start at zero, if I want these Riemann zeta function, I better take n plus 1 to the s, and I want it to be alternating. But of course, that's very well known uh, that that is simply the Riemann zeta function multiplied by a simple known factor, 1 minus 2 to the 1 minus s, because it's the sum of the odd terms minus the sum of the even terms. So it's the sum of uh, all terms minus twice the sum of the even terms, which is simply 2 to the minus s zeta of s. So you have that. And so this gives you immediately if you take z of a half, which still converges because it's, the terms are going to 0, you get minus 1.0. But for instance, if you take minus 1 plus i, then you get, uh, again, I'm not going to write out the values, uh, minus 0 0.114 dot, dot times i. You can compute this on any computer, I mean, on any computer system, Paris or Mathematica, and you find that you get in, in a few seconds, you know, hundreds of digits, and they're completely correct. It's not an alternating sum because now the sum and it's you know, n to this complex power. It's kind of random as well as the minus 1 to the s. But for reasons that are not entirely clear to us, it still works. And similarly, you can take the derivative of the Riemann zeta function. You can get minus 1 to the n log n. That, of course, does fit the thing. And this one, we actually know what it is in terms of zeta prime of a half. And so you get zeta prime of a half to very high accuracy and, uh, and many others. But then you can actually even take it when it diverges. So if you take, for instance, minus 1, if, you, if I take s to be minus an integer, then we know that z of s is a rational number by order. And then the method will converge almost instantly and give you the rational number on the nose. So though it's completely divergent, it works. And an example that a friend, actually an ex-student of mine, has suggested is let's take the derivative again, but I take the sum minus 1 to the n log n. So this doesn't even make sense. But of course, it does make sense as the logarithmic derivative of this thing. Well, now it should start at 1, maybe. Uh, and so this one will put minus 1, and then it's 0 0.2257. And this is, in fact, known in this case. Uh, the, it's 1 half log of pi over 2, because we know the value of the derivative of the zeta function. Uh, so we don't know the derivative. We know the value of zeta, but this term would, I, I forget, whatever it is, you get that. So in other words, you can use the method even when it's divergent terms going to infinity, but regularly enough, or oscillatory, but in a completely different way, and you know, not at all of, of the right form. So now I can ask, uh, uh, take any questions, but I kind of answered Emmanuel. Okay, so I guess you kind of already addressed the question a bit, because so here in, in these cases, like for example, where s is minus 1 plus i, these ak's are not the kth moment of some positive measure. They're not even no, real certainly numbers. No, not. They're not even positive numbers. OK, so it works so more generally than this. Yeah, obviously, if it's a positive number of positive measure, then they're positive. And that's the situation we had in our mind at the beginning. We know that if you have positive numbers that are going to 0, or eventually going to 0, that the sum at least converges. But here I gave lots of examples. Here it's still positive, but it's divergent. And here it's not even positive. It's not even real, in fact. And it's running all over the place. Uh, what I don't know is if you took out the minus 1 to the n. So, you, so if I took this without the minus 1 to the n and called ak the kth term multiplied by minus 1 to the k to force it into the mold, whether it would still work. I mean, I, I just didn't think of doing that. So probably it would equally work. But, there is discussion of that. I mean, the paper's actually 10 pages long. What I told you is the first two pages, given the algorithm and, uh, and the proof. If it's a moment, and then the rest of the paper is variance discussion, what if these hypotheses aren't verified? Uh, I don't want to go into theory in this course. This course is about practical methods. And first of all, this isn't that important anyway, since the other methods I've told will equally work. And secondly, it's pre-probed in Paris. You don't have to know why it works. You can just type some out, and you'll get the answer. So if you type in. If you have a usual sum in Paris, like let's say you want the sum from 1 to 1,000 of 1 over n squared, you would type this. But that would be really stupid if you did that, because then it would give you this an exact rational number with an absolutely gigantic numerator. So if you want to get the pi squared over 6, well, an approximation, 
you should put one point over n squared. Then it treats each term as a real number, and you'll get it to however many decimals you're computing to. So that's if you have a finite sum. But when you use sum out, like the example I get, just gave, it will actually, in, in fun, as a function of the precision that you're currently working with, it will decide what you want. And so it'll put, for instance, n equals 1 to infinity, minus 1 to the nth. I think that you have to write it. Maybe it's even included in the notation. You could just do this. You don't even have to say n from 1 to a large number. It'll automatically terminate at the, right, at the point. It sees that you're working to 400 decimals. So you want 400 decimals. You can't get more than you're inputting. And so that means that the number of things, you, the number of terms you take is 500. So it will stop at the right point automatically. And then it will give you something to 400 decimals. And it's always correct. And it takes zero time. I mean, you, you type it in, you, you hit the return button, and you get the answer. It's essentially instantaneous. If, unless, of course, the function here is something that takes a long time to compute. But if it's a vector, if, if, or if it's very rapid to compute. So as I say, I don't want to talk about theory because it's not that important. All these questions are reasonable. It's not a theoretical course, but they are kind of answered in the paper, which if anybody wants a copy, I can give them, but it's, they can also print it out. So now I've used up my hours and even gone two minutes over time. But still, we can have another quick question. OK, then no questions. Thank you, Campbell, if you're still there for the nice algorithm and for giving me something to talk about for the first half an hour of today's course. OK, so next time will be very rapidly divergent series, as I said. And then next week uh, and the week after will be uh, an application of this circle method, a very non-trivial one. And if I have a little time at the end, this problem is very, very, very slowly divergent sums. But that's the one where I can't find my notes. They're either in Bonn or in China or somewhere. And I couldn't find them, so I'll have to reconstruct. And I think I won't get to it anyway, so it's kind of a bit theoretical. Next week, well, yeah, but today is only Tuesday. So Thursday, day after tomorrow, is still this time, same place, same time, 4 to 5.30 on Thursday. But next week and the week after, it's only two more weeks after this week, is Monday and Wednesday. And I don't quite remember, but I think it was 3 to 4.30. It was certainly an hour and a half. And I think it was one hour earlier, so at 3. It's, anyway, it's on the announcement, and I'll certainly say it next time. I forgot to check it. It could be 2.30 to 4. Anyway, uh, if you don't come next Thursday, you have to look on the internet or on the poster, which is outside. Actually, I think I have the poster right here in my notes, so then I can. No, I was right for once. It's 3 to 4.30.